Okay. <clears throat> All right. As I was saying, uh, usually our Walls president, Sarah Squires Jones, does the introductions, but she's had a complication, can't get here today. So I guess I'll do it. I'm John S. Quarterman. I'm the Sawani Riverkeeper. What's that, you wonder? Well, that's a project in a staff position at Walls Watershed Coalition, Inc. You can see the Walls banner hanging up there. Oh, look, Heather's going to join us. <clears throat> and uh, Walls has been around since 2012. Uh, we formed start, uh, in response to things like Valdosta sewage, everybody's favorite topic. Turns out they're far from alone and deadfalls and rivers. And now we do chainsaw cleanups, one of my favorites. And uh, in 2016, we applied to Waterkeeper Alliance to get a, res a uh, license for Samwani Riverkeeper, for which you got to have a 501c, a grassroots following, a bunch of other stuff. And the Samwani Riverkeeper is supposed to be the spokesperson for the waterways, which in this case is the 10,000 square miles of the Samwani River Basin in Georgia and Florida. So lots of people can be members of Somani Riverkeeper or members of Wall, same thing for that purpose. There's only one actual Somani Riverkeeper, enough of that. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm happy to introduce Chris Adams, C.B. Adams, sometimes known as Turtle Man, maybe he'll tell us why. And um, hmm, seems to be a bit in the shadows. Maybe we can get some light in the front of him there. Um, our, our assistant there in the workshop will probably attend to that. Move some stuff. I hear the assistant now. Okay, so I first ran into Chris, I think it was at uh, General Coffee State Park, where I think he was doing a presentation on Native Americans. And he does a lot of that. He does presentations, Native Americans, settlers, reenactments, things of that sort. He'll tell us what he wants to about that. And he's paddled with us several times at Banks Lake on our full moon paddles to go out and see the bats coming out of cypress trees. And he was a featured speaker last year at our Gala the Walls River Review, and he has graciously uh, agreed to come, and he did come. He drove an hour to get here to give a presentation today about some of his favorite topics having to do with settlers, Native, Native Americans, and how they used waterways. So I'd say that's enough of an invitation. There you go, Chris. I'll take it and run with it. So I tell people this is my usual spiel when I do presentations and things. I'm a 10th generation South Georgian. I've uh, lived in Wiregrass, Georgia my whole life, middle and central South Georgia. My family runs all the way from the Okmulgee River down to the Okefenokee Swamp. And I've always had a strong interest in the history of this place. You know, as a naturalist and a historian, I find it hard to dissect the landscape from the people and the people from the landscape. To tell the full story, you talk about how land shapes people and you talk about how people shape the land. And I, I think what we're going to discuss today is a, a pretty interesting topic that covers what I'm conveying there. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the people living along the Swanee Basin from the Okefenokee all the way down to the Gulf. And where this story starts at is about 10,000 years ago. Anywhere from 10 to 14,000 years ago, people, early people, Paleo Indians, started to move into what we now inhabit, this part of South Georgia and Northern Florida. They relied heavily on the springs and watersheds down there. Places like Okefenokee were still forming and they really didn't hold up there for very long. So there's not a lot of paleo Indian sites in this part of the South. We don't see an influx of people until really the middle to late archaic period. And that's sometime around 10 to 3000 years ago. Those people that settled along our waterways the reason these waterways are important, rivers like the Swanee, the Withlacoochee, the Alapaha, they represent highways, essentially. Where there was water, there was food, there was nourishment for these people, and they followed those highways to those points. For example, up on the Okmulgee River and the Altamaha, those people were living in northern parts of the state, central parts of the state, 
but by the fall of the year, they started to come down south toward the coast, making winter camp. And what they did there is they gathered the hickory and the swamp chestnuts. They would ground those in the mill, and they would set up fish camps. They relied heavily on our waterways for that. Uh, really into the woodland period is my, my favorite period. Right around that same time is when we start to find examples of pottery showing up. Uh, pottery here in Georgia is some of the oldest found anywhere in North America. During the late uh -huh. Archaic period, around the time of, say, 4,400 years ago or so, if I remember correct, Callings Island on the Savannah River, that's where some of the oldest pottery has been found in the country. So they... Uh, 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 so, someone has background noise. If you're not speaking, could you please mute? Yeah, there's a little interference there. I don't know which which camera it's coming from here. I got it. You good? All right. But during the woodland period, there was a culture of people specific to the Swanee Valley. And at this time, you have to remember, there's not written history on these people. A lot of what we know about them comes from archaeological evidence. What the archaeologists find they base their data, their information on those findings. So we don't know but very little about their religious practices. We don't really know about their language, but we know the basic things, which include the fact that they utilize these bodies of water as their means of transportation. You know, when you were walking through the woods, even today, an unburned tract, say portions of Okie Finoki, John, I know you've been out there and seen that. You're head high in brush and weeds and vines. It's hard to get through some of that stuff. So these people would not have gone through that. The easiest path to get from point A to point B was following the edge of the river. So I like to think of it when I'm walking the banks of the Swanee, north side or south side of the river, those same little footpaths that game and that we follow today that recreators when they go to swim there follow those are essentially the same paths that these early native people followed because it was a path of least resistance but during the 1990s archaeologists started describing the group of people that basically inhabited along the swanee river as the swanee valley culture and they were distinct from others because of pottery examples and tools that they uh, fabricated from flint, from quartz, or excuse me, not quartz, flint and shirt, and also coral. You find a lot of fossilized coral points down in Florida. Those are very interesting. But saying all that, you know, I'm, I'm discussing almost 9,000 years of history right there in just a few minutes. I'm no archaeologist, but where we really dive into the information we know about indigenous people comes from the historic period, from those early accounts of European settlers and colonizers. The Spanish were among the first Europeans that these people encountered. And at that time, we start to find that they're calling these people names that we recognize them today, like Tamuqua. The Tamuquan people pretty well inhabited this area of Georgia and Northern Florida during uh, the early historic period. And that's also when the Spanish started to put missions along some of the river sides. The Spanish knew that if you followed water, water meant there, were, there was life and where there's life, you're gonna find people, habitations and such. And that's exactly what they found when they encountered the Tamuquan people. Areas west of the Suwannee Basin though, were inhabited by the Appalachian, and at times these different groups living during the period of Spanish colonization, they were at ends with one another. They sometimes made war over different disputes or people who they sided with. Now the Creeks up here in Southern Georgia, in the early 1600s, they sided pretty well with the English. They were providing them good trade goods and things the Appalachian down in Florida were siding with the Spanish. And that came to a head around the turn of the 1600s into the 1700s. Uh, during this time too, there's something else I wanna mention that most people don't associate the Suwannee Valley or Southern Georgia, Northern Florida with at all. 
most people, if you ask them today where cattle raising occurs, the knee jerk answer to that is, oh, Texas. Well, Florida today still produces more beef calves than any other state in the union. Now they're finished in Texas, but they do promote, uh, produce more beef cattle that way. Back then in the 1500s, uh, 1521, Ponce de Leon landed off the coast of Florida and he brought the first hogs and horses and cattle and citrus to Florida. After the Spanish had overstayed their welcome though, and the Calusa sent them packing back to Cuba, they didn't bother to pack up those horses and cattle. And different instances of other explorers and colonizers coming, they too brought their livestock with them. Same instance. They might've had to leave in, in haste and they left those livestock. So what happened is they ran wild on the landscape and created these land race breeds, like what today we recognize as piney woods or cracker cattle. And uh, I've had the privilege of working with those cattle professionally, the last of the, that heritage breed. But these were the cattle that were running wild along the Swanee Basin and other rivers in Northern Florida, South Georgia. And some of the first cowboys, I guess as we'd call them cowboys or cowmen, were not necessarily Spanish. They were also the Indians employed by these ranchos along the Camino Real, the old Spanish road that ran across northern Florida and right over the Suwannee River. Um, by the early 1700s, though, the English colonies of the Carolinas started wanting to probe south into Florida and see just what they could get away with, what the Spanish, how they would react to it. And Governor Moore of South Carolina brought with him some troops and some allied Creek Indians, and they raided the province of Appalachia near what is today Tallahassee. They stole, they raided rather, several hundred or somewhere around a thousand or so head of cattle and carried them back through Georgia. This was a very lucrative business, cattle was in those days. And the Spanish government also couldn't keep a handle on it either with their own people living in the colony of Florida because those folks were uh, not giving the cattle or any of the proceeds back to Spain. They were actually illegally shipping them down to Cuba at the time. So the Swanee Basin, uh, it provided a lot of forage and a lot of cover for these cattle, which I'll go a little more in depth on here shortly. But by the end of the 17th century, the Spanish had pretty much abandoned uh, a lot of those missions. By 1730, there, there were no Spanish missions in this portion of the South here. And those ranchos, though they were still existent, there were not as many then either. So we skip ahead just a little bit toward the end of the 18th century. And a fellow by the name of William Bartram comes through. And I'm sure I know you know who William Bartram is. Bartram is a a hero of mine in a way, you know, he was a, a Quaker from Pennsylvania who decides when the Revolutionary War is going along, he just says, no, you, you, you folks can have this. I'm going to go explore the jungles and swamps of the South where no sane white man has ever gone before. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, he runs into a Seminole near the Swanee River on the Georgia, Florida line, nearly gets his hide handed to him. Uh, but he manages to go through all these hardships and struggles and just takes it in stride. And along the way, he, he names plants and animals and describes them for scientific record, which few, if anybody, had ever done before. Bartram, though, when he comes and sees the Swanee River, he describes it as one of the most beautiful places he had ever seen in his life and along all of his travels. And that is referenced in his book, Travels of William Bartram, that's the short title for it, for those of y'all that know that book. But you can find that online. It's a pretty comprehensive uh, account of his studies and his travels at that time. And it mentions the Swanee and the region around it. But that, that was kind of short-lived. He goes on back up north. After he comes through here, though, it's still very much a wilderness. The only people living along the Swanee Basin or southern Georgia areas around the Alapahal all the way to the Okefenokee. Most of those people were pretty uh, rugged sort, a wild people, if you will. 
you know, we talk about westward expansion. We automatically think men crossing the Missouri and heading out to the Rockies, you know, like Lewis and Clark. Westward expansion to happen on a small scale here. What people fail to realize is the bend of the Okmulgee River was essentially the defining line between civilization and wilderness till about the 1820s. Counties like Telfair, uh, oh, I see there. Yeah, you're putting Bartram's Travels in there. So counties like Telfair, Tattnall, that represented the cusp of the frontier right there. People started pushing that limit a little bit. And I often compare it, if you've ever seen the movie uh, oh, uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis, Last of the Mohicans, you know, he talks about these people crossing the mountains and heading to Cane Tuck, which was then Indian territory, it was frontier. They chose their independence over living in a, a civilized society where daily they kind of knew what to expect, kind of like our lives today. You know, we, we have set schedules. We're here when we need to be. We're comfortable in our own beds. People don't realize the hardships that these early settlers went through. And I'm going to refer to one of my notes here in just a moment. But as they started to venture across the Okmulgee and settle in these places, this wild frontier, they had to rely heavily on the game and on the, uh, the mast that the oak trees and hickory trees could provide them in the fall of the year. They made their flower, they grew subsistent crops as best they could. But again, another example of these early pioneers being different from us today, if we go home and we burn a pot of rice or something that's nothing you know we'll go back to the dollar store or walmart we'll grab a bag of rice and we'll go home and redo it again people do not realize if if your crop failed back then if you were not a resourceful person you were as good as dead you'd have to forage on turtles and possums and at that time too they had to tweak their religious doctrine a little bit too you know there's some old uh, Old Testament scripture that would prevent earlier pioneers from wanting to eat things like catfish or things that quote creepeth upon the earth. I'm sorry when you uh when you starve and you'll quickly learn how to eat an alligator or a turtle, and that's why today at a Baptist fish fry you won't go without catfish on the table, and you won't go without seeing uh things like alligator appear every now and again. But back then, let me see if I can refer to my note here. Y'all bear with me just a minute. I've got it on my phone here and I've turned it off. But these people, as they started to come in, a lot of the outsiders knew them as crackers. And to kind of dispel some of the myths surrounding that, cracker is not necessarily a derogatory term. It's all in how you use it. I regard myself as one. And a lot of people think that the term is uh, equated with the term redneck. It's not. Those are two different things. Cracker, as was first described by William Shakespeare in his play King John, 1594, he quotes, What craker is this who deeps our ears with an abundance of superfluous breath? In short, he's saying, Who is this won't hush up? They were braggarts and boasters, lively talkers and storytellers. That's synonymous with anybody you'd call a cracker nowadays, including myself, I would think. But the way I use it is to describe a people whose lineage goes back as far as they can remember, as far as stories can recall, 10 generations in one place is a long period of time. Your people, my people are just as much a part of this landscape as the plants and the animals are at this point. We're interwoven into that tapestry, the story of this place. So cracker to me is not a derogatory term if it's used the way I convey it. But that's the way, uh, that's how these people would describe these crackers were sometimes considered a lawless set of rascals who dared to venture into the wilderness and try to make a living for themselves. A lot of them were primarily Scots-Irish uh, descent from the Carolinas. Their people had come over in the 1700s. Uh, in fact, by the time some of them left the Carolinas, they were still speaking uh, Gaelic. And when they got to Georgia, that accent started to change. The draw came out a little bit more, but they ventured into places like down here. 
some people I've heard always said their ancestors were running from something or running to something. They don't know what it was, but this is where they ended up. And that seems to be a reoccurring thing when you look into local family histories. But by the early 1800s, uh, we start to see problems with the remaining indigenous people living here. In 1814, the Creek Civil War starts to uprise in Alabama. It was a dispute among the white sticks and the red sticks, those who were more traditional and those who were more for learning the ways of the white man, essentially, farming and intermingling in society. This created a rift among the Muscogee people, which eventually led to conflict. Uh, the Red Sticks attacked Fort Mims in Alabama. And when Andrew Jackson's army, you know, he's down there fighting the War of 1812, but he's also fighting that second war all the time, too. He crushes the Red Sticks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And in the years following, they didn't stay in their ancestral homelands. They had to flee. Even their own people wouldn't accept them at that point. So they started coming down here into southern Georgia. And that's where we get into the importance of rivers again, utilizing them as a thoroughfare, as a highway. They would follow those creek swamps and river bottoms, and they made their way down into Florida to band together with the remnants of tribes down there that had either been wiped out by enslavement, disease, uh, or those that just remained in an area concealed to outside newcomers. So these are the people we would then consider to be the Seminole of Florida at that time. And by the 1830s, most of uh, the creeks that were still in Georgia, they were remaining on their land in opposition because when the government said, all right, you have to be removed after the Indian Removal Act was passed, the people living down here who weren't necessarily Creek. They considered themselves, say, like the Miccosukee. They said, oh, well, those people signed that treaty. We didn't sign it, so we're staying. The state of Go or Georgia, the government, did not see it that way, and naturally they hired contractors to come and try and remove these people. That's what led to the Second Creek or Second Seminole War, as we call it today. For sake of this conversation, we'll call it the Florida War, as they did back then. But a lot of militia, a lot of families, they joined together to fight these natives still living here. And by the end of that conflict, there were almost no indigenous people remaining in this portion of the state, except those that could hide out very well. But backtracking, now that I've got my phone pulled up, I want to read this briefly. This is a pretty good account, a pretty basic account, too, of the lives of those early settlers here. This is from A History of Savannah and South Georgia by William Harden, and he's describing, he's referencing the families in the area of Lowndes County, Georgia, in the mid to late 1820s. He said they were pioneers in very truth, being the first permanent white settlers of Lowndes County, more especially of its northern portion. There were no mills in that section of the county for several years thereafter, all the grain being ground in mills operated by hand, they kept sheep and raised cotton. The women used to card, spin, and weave the homespun material from which she fashioned all the garments worn by the family. The wild game found in the forest furnished the early settlers with a large part of their subsistence, while acorns, beech nuts, and walnuts were so plentiful that only need of feeding hogs was to keep them from growing wild, an occasional meal serving for that purpose. Very little ready money was then in circulation in the South, and in the newer settlements, few store goods were used, salt, sugar, and coffee being the principal articles brought in. I mean, it was a bare bones lifestyle these people live. But what he's talking about, these early settlers to this section had a lot to do with roads being put in place. Uh, we've talked briefly, you and I, before about Coffee's Road and the history of it. When John Coffey established that military road leading from Jacksonville, Georgia, down to Old Town, Tallahassee, down in Florida, it opened a way for people, those people living on the cusp of the frontier up there and on the Okmulgee Bend, it opened a way for them to infiltrate this area and to stake a claim. Now, when I say road, it was little more than a goat path. It was wide enough for two carts to pass by one another and it was just cleared. It was not graded or leveled. But these intrepid pioneers came in 
and within the first year of Coffee's Road, the creation of it, some 200 families moved into this section and that caused for the creation of Lowndes County. But again, those civilizations centered around waterways. If there was not a steady supply of fresh drinking water or a place to follow, as it mentions, foraging the mast of some of these hardwood trees, dropping acorns and things, that's the river bottoms. You won't find the people just living high out on a sand hill somewhere where there's little shade and it's dry and arid. They relied heavily on the swamp bottoms. Now, going back to the Seminole War, just a few years after this period I'm talking about, one of the most influential settlers of the Swanee Basin, and one that is not talked about today, is one I want to bring up. We mentioned cattle way while ago. Cattle was a mainstay for these people. That was their source of income. That's what they traded. I talked with a gentleman just yesterday, an older gentleman. He said, growing up, and this would have been the early 1900s there, he said, growing up, very little beef ended up on the table. It was always pork. Uh, seldom did chicken end up on the table. Pork was the go-to meal for these people. Hogs were easy to raise. Uh, I raise Osbo Island hogs, and let me tell you, one hog plus one hog equals 400 hogs at the end of their journey. Uh, it's easy to, to produce hogs. Cattle, not so much. You're depending there on the, the dry and rainy seasons. That determines your yield of calves every year. Is the forage good? Can she eat enough and her bag support milking a, a young calf? So cattle were a prized commodity. They were often rounded up once a year and they were earmarked to show identification. But one of these settlers that would go down in history as being the most influential cattleman in the state of Florida's history was William Brenton Hooker. Hooker was one of those early settlers of the Okmulgee Bend region. He was born up there, his family was there. They grew up very poor. Uh, his mother, as I recall, was part of the Methodist church and they got so bad off in need of money that they started a, a public house, a tavern, and they were eventually kicked out of the church for some reason because of that. They were later relocated. They came down to the newly formed Ware County where he got his start, uh, his affluent start as far as a uh, sheriff, a public office. He was the second sheriff of Ware County then. And a little sidebar here, Billy's Lake and Billy's Island in the swamp are named for a gentleman by the name of Indian Billy, who was a horse trader, who was killed by some fellows up near the north end of the swamp. They looked to rob him and do him in. This would have been unheard of at that time, but Sheriff Hooker and a posse of all white men tried to trail down the killers of this dead Indian man, further proving that some relations between white settlements and their indigenous neighbors were not often always bad. He must have been a well-respected, well-liked member of that community. But Hooker, as he establishes himself as a law enforcement public official, he then moves in Florida. 1842, at the end of the uh, Seminole War, Congress passes the Armed Occupation Act which pretty much guaranteed 160 acres of land to any settler going into Florida as long as they would sign up for militia duty. And there were some conditions to this, being a U.S. citizen or intended citizen, settling and cultivating at least five acres of land in eastern or southern Florida for five years, building a house on the land within the first year, not claiming land within two miles of a military post, being willing to provide militia service if needed. Those were the conditions. Within a few years of that Occupation Act, Florida's population soared to around 60,000 people, which allowed for it to achieve statehood in 1845. So this was a big deal. Hooker was a part of that. But the reason I bring him up, though, again, going back to cattle raising, up near Jennings, Florida, and starting that area all the way down, there's also the Swanee River State Park, I believe it's right down there. There's a Civil War fortification. They talk about the ferry there. That was one of the areas where Hooker had some cow pens. By 1860, this man had cow pens from one end of the Swanee down to the other. And 
I like this story. It's kind of an underdog story. He grows up poor. He gets kicked out of the church with his family, moves to a new place, becomes a sheriff, becomes a cattleman, and he's trying to achieve a, a foothold in politics. And that's how you did it at that time. You amassed land and livestock. That was it. Hooker, by 1860, had amassed 10,000 head of cattle from one end of the Swanee Basin to the other. Ear notched them all for his own, built his own cow pens. And one of the reasons why he doesn't get the credit for this is in 1860, a man by the name of Jacob Summerlin brokers a deal to purchase his cattle as he's getting out of it. Summerlin sort of takes the credit for being the cracker cow king of Florida. Now, given Summerlin credit, he was a cattleman. He knew cattle, but he bought a vast majority of his that drove him into prominence. He didn't start like Hooker did. Hooker is a, a monumental figure in all of this as we're talking about it. Moving on. From that, well, we got a little sound there. Moving on from that. During this era, it was also that commerce along the rivers in the form of steamboats began to occur. There was one that ran up and down, uh, I believe it was with Lacucci there, the Madison. I could be wrong. It might have been the Swanee River, but there were several steamboats there that served as essentially floating mercantile stores and mail carriers. This represented the opening of this frontier into this uh, Western stage culture. You know, the Pony Express would deliver mail out west. Well, this was the Pony Express, but on the rivers. They brought, you know, news of the outside world to these people living in the back country that had little way of finding out otherwise. But this kind of come to a halt around the mid 19th century when the Civil War began. When the Civil War occurred, it was a few years into it that the Confederacy realized Florida was going to be the breadbasket for them. Farmers yielded a lot of corn, a lot of sweet potatoes, but also they recognized the importance of the cattle herds. Florida had thousands and thousands of head of cattle. And during the wartime, they actually raised, mustered a regiment of special cow cavalry to guarantee that these cattle were moved from one end of the state up to the railheads in Georgia and Quitman uh, over in Albany. And from there, those cattle were shipped to Savannah all the way to the Atlanta campaign. It was cattle from this section of the country that managed to let the Confederacy limp along to the end of the war. Had it not been for that, you know, as they say, an army moves on its stomach without food, the Confederacy would have just crippled itself right then and there when Vicksburg fell. But Florida managed to allow for that to continue. And in 1864, there was an invasion from Jacksonville trying to penetrate deeper into the Florida territory and ended up with a battle at Olusty near Lake City. Well, that federal uh, army, their intention was to get to the Swanee River and burn the railroad bridge it crossed down there. Um, there were also several sawmills, anything of military importance, the federal army had set out to destroy. But the Confederate army, uh, they left post along the Swanee River to thwart that attack and drive the Federals back to Jacksonville. And there never was an attempt at an invasion from that side of Florida again. But we know how the war ended. We know what happened. And it was during the Reconstruction years that Florida tried to get back on its feet. Southern Georgia did as well. One of the things, and I'm going to flip ahead here in my notes. Before the war, they had tried naval stores down here and were successful in portions. And for those of our viewers that don't know what naval stores is, that's turpentining, turpentine operations the extraction of pine resin to turn it into spirits of gum, turpentine, and gum rosin. But the war put a halt to that as well. After the war, though, you've got an influx of skilled laborers in another part of the country, the Carolinas, and these were primarily now freedmen, the former slaves. They were skilled laborers because they had been employed in the extraction of gum in the Carolinas before the war. And the method that they used to extract the gum was called boxing. That's where a small cavity was created at the bottom of a tree that would hold around a quarter or two of gum. Well, if you put a box around the bottom of a pine tree, what you do is you girdle it. 
you're not allowing for the nutrients to flow from the buttress all the way to the crown, that ultimately kills the tree in time. So by war's end, they had exhausted the yellow pine timber in the Carolinas. So naturally, now they're free. They don't have jobs where they're at, so they come south where the work is. All along this area, the Swanee Basin over to the Okefenokee and southwest Georgia, this was naval stores country. It started off slow, but by the turn of the 20th century there, we had more turpentine steels in southern Georgia and northern Florida than anywhere else in the deep south that the industry was going on. And those men, they worked, they worked tirelessly. It was terribly hard work out in the hot sun during the spring, summer, and even early fall months, dipping gum, extracting it, carrying it to the steels. I've got a few facts here I want to read off. So the timberland back then could also be purchased for $1.25 an acre. It was dirt cheap. And the naval stores industry was driving commerce along down here, but then the timber industry picked up. The trees were being felled at an alarming rate. We know that areas along the Swanee and other areas, other rivers here in this part of South Georgia, they floated log rafts down to the mills. The New South era sort of shifted how people made money, how we existed down here. We go from those subsistence farmers that lived in the woodlands to now suddenly we've got people working regular jobs getting paid for it, hard money passing from hand to hand. Uh, paved roadways too led to a different kind of newcomer uh, now vacationing in this part of the South. We had roads like 441, the Woodpecker route. A lot of snowbirds, you know, started to travel down here and vacation in Florida. And that shifted the way people worked, what they did. Roadways meant bigger towns popped up this idea of floating steamboats down the river getting mail or news to these people that was almost non-existent by world war ii following world war ii our rivers they ceased to be hubs of activity as they had been no more did steamboats carry the goods uh nor did the timber rafts float down to mills rivers like the swanee the alapaha the withlacoochee along with smaller creeks and streams just became hubs of activity for anglers and sportsmen and people for recreation. It, it was a change in time, certainly at the 20th century. We go from rivers being so important as trade networks, this thousands and thousands of years history, to suddenly now we've got our people swimming and paddling, which is a good thing, meaning that we still utilize the rivers, we utilize them in different ways, but this history that I've discussed today shouldn't be neglected. It shouldn't be forgotten because it is such an important part of the story of these places. But I will turn it over to you. That's what I've got. Do you have any questions or does anybody else have any questions for me? I have a question. All right. I think that's Miss Heather right there. What you got? Yes, you can hear my accent. Um, <laughs> I right um, on the Alapaha River where I live, um, which is near Alapaha, there is a sunken barge that was uh, used. Now this part of the river is not navigable most of the year, and I don't understand how there would have been enough water in the river to justify having a barge or to use the rivers to float um, uh, lumber down uh, downstream to the mills. How Can you explain that or how extensively were these smaller streams used uh, for commerce and travel? Well, believe it or not, they were used more than we think of. Uh... It depended on the spring and fall freshets. When, when water levels would come up during the wet seasons, I believe Ward's history of Coffee County talks about this. Farmers supplemented their income back then. Uh, they cut what they called scab timber, which was just basic, you know, raw timber, 
and they piled it together as quickly as they could. When the water levels came up, they would use mules and oxen to drag those logs down to the edge. And even some of our smaller streams, creeks today, as you know, were probably a bit more clear back then. Uh, we've let a lot of things grow up. Things look differently in the last century and a half. But it's possible that on those little tributaries of rivers like the Alapaha, some farmer had in his mind that he said, I'm going to float just a few logs down, try and get a little hard money. And the river had not come up enough yet or it had come up and it hit a snag and it just beached right there. But there are examples of this all across South Georgia, not just exclusively here. Uh, it could be that, or it could have been some other industry going on there, maybe that I'm not aware of. They could have had a barge out there doing work. When you describe it as a barge, are you talking just logs beached down there or an actual watercraft of some kind? An actual watercraft. Apparently, they when they launched it, it sank immediately. That, you know, I, I couldn't tell you on that. I'd have to do a little more research myself. But You'll have back, to come visit. Yeah, I'll have to come look at it. I'd like to see that myself. John, you got something? Uh, we need to do a chainsaw cleanup in that stretch anyway. Let's, uh, let's do that and go find that thing. Take some pictures at least. There you go. Give me a read. I've got some pictures. House. You got pictures, you say? Yes. Uh, can you send them also where it is? Sure. And then we could go look at it. I'm always up for a treasure hunt. <laughs> That's my kind of treasure. I could care less about gold or silver. Now, you show me an old sunken boat in a river around here. I'm very interested. <laughs> Low water level. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhere along your river frontage? Yes. Well, we should go look at it. I'm guessing you can get to it from land as well. Yes. Easy. Hmm. You can drive right up next to it. Oh. Got some other folks tuned well, in. Anybody else have a question? Oh, Fanny, surely you have questions. Fanny needs to unmute. Most of what I've talked about today, you know, we, we spend 45 minutes talking about this sort of stuff. There are topics included and embedded in my notes here. You could spend two or three hours just discussing anywhere from indigenous history to the times during the Civil War, the turpentine era. There's so much history here in South Georgia, and I, I can get off chasing a hundred rabbits talking about it, but they're all interesting stories in this. You could easily do an hour just talking about uh, Deserters Island and the Okefenokee Deserters uh, Landing uh, up on the upper Alapaha, up, up above where Heather is and so forth. Mm -hmm. Those river swamps were vital to the deserters during the war. And what a lot of people don't realize is South Georgia had the highest concentration of Confederate deserters anywhere in the Confederacy during the Civil War. These were a lot of home folks that quickly figured out this was not their fight. They weren't going to be a part of it, and they got away from it as best they knew how. They went to those places like the Seminole and the Creeks did during the Seminole War. They knew how to hide because they had, years prior to that, chased people through it, hidden in it themselves. They knew how to navigate these river swamps. It, it took me about five minutes to unmute, but this is totally fascinating to me, John. And you know it is because that is our history. And I am going to have to go back and dissect this and probably write a whole book of questions about what I've I've learned. And, and this is this is so fascinating that it's happening today when Brooks County is meeting about our solar problem. And wouldn't you know that the coffee in Jackson Road is at the heart of this dispute with the mm -hmm. solar solar problem. And uh, my ancestors were the ones who came in 
with them in 1818 and 1825 and uh, with the Coffee Rose, Cyan Hall and Gorntos and all of those. So this is really, really uh, fascinating to me. And when you mention about uh, Quitman and and, uh, and and that, we I've heard this, I've heard that all my life. I'm 71 and I've heard that all my life. I've got tons of questions, but I've, I've got to write them down. <laughs> That's all right. I appreciate the positive feedback, but you, you get back to me anytime you want me to answer some of those and I'll do my best. Oh, I will. And that is the first time I've heard that explanation about cracker. <laughs> I'd never heard that one before. I heard the one about the, the sound, the, the sound of the whip and everything. But this, mm -hmm. this is my first time hearing that, that version of it. <laughs> And that's a part of it too. Yeah, I, when I do presentations on that, I, I'll explain the Shakespearean origin, the word crake, which is an old Gaelic word. Mm -hmm. But that story about the cow whip, mm -hmm. uh, when the industry, when the cattle industry was thriving in Florida back during the 19th century, those cowmen would drive the cattle into town and there'd always be some townswoman or man standing out there and say, well, here come those crackers again. They'd hear the long platted whip popping over the heads of those cattle. Mm -hmm. There is also another or origin story, which I didn't include. In the early 1800s, Florida was still Spanish up until 1821 when it was annexed to the United States. But the Spanish did not like the idea of these rascals coming over the state line and living in Spanish Florida. It was similar to the environment out in Texas in the 1830s. The Mexican government said, yeah, you people can come live here. You know, you're not Mexican. You don't speak Spanish. You're not Catholic. But if you learn to speak the language, if you conform to Catholicism, sure, by all means, stay. Well, those people heard the word stay. They didn't hear anything else. And they just came in and settled. <laughs> Same thing was going on down here on the Florida side. The uh, one letter gets back to the Earl of Dartmouth, I think. He says, your lordship, what we mean by these crackers is we tell them where to settle and they don't. We tell them we're not to settle and they do. They are a lawless set of rascals living along the border between Georgia and Florida, end quote. And I mean, so now we're talking lively talkers and storytellers, jokesters, braggarts, illegal immigrants, and cowboys. I mean, it's a, it, it could make an, an entire fascinating series of books just out of that topic. Mm. For those of you um, not familiar with the old coffee road, um, wrong one, let me try again. One of our viewers wants to know your contact information. So my contact, you can find me on Facebook pretty easily. Um, we've got a viewer asking me about it. It's Turtle Man Chris Adams on Facebook. There's a public page as well as uh, my other organization, which I run and operate, it's the Wiregrass Ecological and Cultural Project. And that's my personal mission is to try and get into schools, fairs, festivals, wherever anybody will listen to represent our cultural heritage here, to share these stories with people. And I occasionally, I'll post edited uh, pieces out of books or some of the work that I'm doing, working with heirloom crops or heritage breed livestock, storytelling programs, either of those two pages is where you find it. That, again, is Turtle Man Chris Adams on Facebook and the Wiregrass Ecological and Cultural Project. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been fascinating. You're quite welcome. I'm glad. I'm glad and you and my um my grandfather's from Wiregrass County, um, Instance Cook. Cook, that's yep, that's an old name down here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've been there for a super long time. So it's, I'm gonna actually look up the Wiregrass Ecological and Cultural Site so I can join that. Is sounds good to me. I, I'm glad. To People follow along, they little they learn a little bit they didn't even know they needed to know. <laughs> Thank I you see, so I, much. I oh, sent um, uh, photos of that uh, sunken barge to John if you want a screen share. Otherwise, um, you can use it for later 
um, planning a trip. All right. And uh, Turtle Man's contact is in the chat. This other contact is the Wiregrass Ecological and Cultural Project. Um, let's see what Heather sent. Um, how did you send it? Email. Okay. Now to get Gmail to reveal it to me. Oh, okay. It's at jsq at courtman.org. Yeah. I can't screen share uh, for me, can I? I can let you screen share. But you can let's, use let's it organize. later anyway. Let's organize that one moment. I'm glad y'all know how to do this because John had to haul me in here in front of this computer just to get this done today. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm not technologically inclined as some are. John, this is Mark Stalvey. I had a, I had a question. Um, you know, we're a couple miles south of the coffee road at my place. And are, are you guys aware of any uh, skirmishes that happened along the coffee road? Um, along the uh, Fletcher's Ferry area? Um, Not off the top of my head. Uh, near the Coffee Road, yeah, there were plenty of skirmishes during the Indian Wars near the Coffee Road, but I don't just recollect one right near Fletcher's Ferry. I could be wrong, but uh, I know Brushy Creek, Cow Creek, there was an engagement up near Ray's Mill Pond. It was very sporadic during the years of 30, 1836 and 37, uh, when the primary conflict took place. And then there were some instances after some Seminole warriors had taken up in the Okefenokee in 38, but then most of the military action was then centered around the swamp itself. Um, but I'll have to look uh, in. Heather has shared a picture. Heather has shared a picture of the barge, I believe. Yes. Okay, quit sharing. We're looking at your picture. Yes. Well, you've seen it. I'll have to get out there and look at that in person, I think, to be able to tell a little bit more about what I'm seeing here. But that's, yeah, that doesn't make sense to me why there would be a barge in that small of a channel there. It, it also looks like it's, attached to the shore it looks more like footings of a dam or something yeah that's it the chances are it's filled in a lot since then yeah um oh sorry i hit stop uh, you got it anyway chris i sent it to you as well all right i appreciate that i'll take a look at it and we'll try and get an answer here pretty shortly then that'll be good John, you got anything else you want to add? I'm going to attempt to show the old coffee road if I can get sharing to cooperate. While he's doing that, to explain just a little bit more about Coffee's Road, it was apparent during the conflicts with the Creeks in the early 1800s and when Jackson's army, Andrew Jackson's army, came down and pretty much invaded Florida, when the troops got to these points beyond civilization, it was very hard to get munitions, supplies, provisions to them. The Coffee Road, uh, when John Coffee proposed this, he said, if the state would just give me the money, I will supply a road from Jacksonville connecting to the city of Tallahassee in Florida. And from Jacksonville, Georgia, it further extended to Milledgeville connecting the then capital all the way down to the Gulf Coast. So it was, I think that's somewhere around 200 miles right there. It was quite 
the road for its time. And it was in fact, the only road for a time south of the Okmulgee in this section. And it did not only just allow for the movement of troops and supplies, like we discussed earlier, it allowed for settlers to come in on that. So that's Jacksonville way up there on the, I think that's Aldama, isn't it? Uh, the Okmulgee right there at the bend. Yeah, okay. It comes down across the Satilla and then farther down across the Alapaha. And I think Heather can probably say where that is. Yes, that's on my property. There you go. I've been trying to get Julian Fields to take us there for a while, but no luck. Oh, and then, uh, I can probably line that up. So there you I'm go. Hearing, That'd be yes. great. I'm hearing we need to have an archaeological dig on Heather's place is what I'm hearing. <laughs> yep. Sounds like it. And this is around about Fetch's Ferry on the with the Coochie. It keeps going through. Uh, comes across about Cecil, and then it heads a bit south, goes through the edge of Lowndes County. And you may notice there's like, uh, seems like two different routes. As near as I can tell, there were different routes at different times. There were. Uh, what that amounted in was when they built the early road, Coffee did have to guess at certain points where that road crossed creeks and washouts and rivers. So the initial route was changed a little bit in later years. That's where you start seeing signs today, you know, new coffee road, old coffee road. Most of the original tracks mm -hmm. stayed the same, but there were a few bends like what you're showing here on the map that routed around for some reason or a spur of it was routed because a new settlement popped up. Right. So it either went across where Georgia 122 is across the Little River or across the Morven Road or different plans at different times. And eventually it gets over into Brooks County around the area which Fanny is very familiar with. I think that's your area there, Fanny. And my great great grandfather, great 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 grandfather also. He came directly from Scotland in 1835 and bought land somewhere near Morven, around in this area. And then he moved down towards um, Quitman and had some land over here. He bought a sawmill. So anyway, it continued on over through Barwick and to Thomasville and then down towards Tallahassee, like you said. So it was quite the project. And in case it's not obvious, I do not believe they hired people to do this. They had people who had no choice. Yeah, there was a coffee. As I recall, he did pay the owners of certain enslaved people for their usage over the period of several months. But the surprising thing is, too, I was researching this the other day. And I didn't want to talk too much about it in this program, but you could do a whole series on the coffee road itself. There were actually volunteers of enterprising minded people that they said, yeah, we'll help you build this thing along the way. The way they saw it was if they helped to build a road, that meant that people would come in with people that meant commerce. So they could set up things like taverns or boarding houses and enterprise that way. Not everyone was of that mindset, but that seems far fetched to people today. You mean a, a person would volunteer their time to go build a road? That's like saying you'd volunteer to go help DOT pave a highway out here. We don't comprehend that in today's time because to us, a road is just something we travel on. There's hundreds of roads. Back then, this was a big deal. So we owe it to those enslaved workers and to the volunteers that helped make that possible because Coffee's Road was the backbone of South Georgia for a time period during the antebellum years. It was the only way in or out. This I've, road I've done a little, years... <clears throat> Go ahead. I, I've done a little reading about the movement of troops along the Coffee Road. And um, there was an old commissary building 
in Cecil that was torn down uh, maybe 10 years ago. John, I don't know if you remember that building. It was right along the railroad there in Cecil. Um, I had found a picture of it online, but I had gotten the old mantle out of that building before it was torn down. Um, but the, I think it that building, the commissary was built a little bit after the war, maybe maybe eight years, six or eight years, 10 years after the war. Mm -hmm. um, my my uh, Futch relatives there that live, um, or we still live in Futch settlement there on the south of the Coffee Road. There's still an old farm place there at Futch's Ferry that um, one of my relatives told me. There's still actually an existing barn there. It's getting in pretty bad shape, but they used to build coffins in the top of that barn. And this was right before you dropped down into the bridge where <laughs> you crossed the river. But they said that um, as the Indians moved up and down that river, I'm assuming it was probably Seminoles, that um, they had painted on the side of that barn a symbol that basically said, good, good white man. And the Indians would... Uh, they. they my relative told me he's passed away, but he told me a story that was related to him by his grandfather. The, the Indians had come there uh, seeking assistance that one of the ladies was having trouble in childbirth and they were there looking for some some oil or something. But uh, in reading some more of that history from the Futches Ferry Bridge south uh, towards my place, um, there's a spot on the river that they said never flooded. And it's kind of hard to believe now because it's, it's so flat and that's a pretty wide floodplain in there. But they said that's where the Indians would always camp on that. I, they called it an island. But I've I've always tried to determine where that is, and I've I've actually seen where the old ferry crossing was. But I've I've always wanted to find that island because I know that probably be a good spot for artifacts. But I I just not been able to determine where that highest spot is in there. Oral histories sure. like that are worth more than gold. I'm telling you, that's that's mm -hmm. interesting to hear that. Sure, don't see anything that looks like an island here on this aerial map. No, it's it's it could have just been washed away over time, but they I guess as the Indians were escaping persecution, that they they were safe on that island, and that's where it was just a a, a camp. Uh, from you know generational camp or a stopover for those those folks to stay along there mm -hmm. pretty interesting history there that's an, yeah that's an interesting stretch we had three paddlers come up from south florida once and they put up put in up here at 37 there's a long shaggy dog story about having to find a walmart on a sunday to patch their boat but anyway so they set out the first thing they turned back and looked at me standing on the bridge and said which way they got as far as almost Camp Tiger at the first night and head to camp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They kept that's, getting lost. That's a long stretch. I've I've never done the whole stretch from 37 or down to uh, from Futch's Ferry to 122, but it's a long, winding, narrow stretch. And they had 18-foot narrow kayaks. Not the best thing for that mm. kind of area. No, no. Wow. Yeah, it's a long way down to 122, which is the next obvious takeout after Camp Tiger. And Camp Tiger isn't obvious. It's a high bluff there. Maybe that's yeah. what they were talking about. It, it could be. Could be. But they, they the way they talked, it was an island in the middle of the river, which gave them some protection. Um, but but I don't know. I'd have to go back and look that history up. I can't remember what, what source I found it in. Well, sometime when the water's high, we should go try to find it. Yep, yep. This has been great today. Thank you guys. <laughs> um, could everybody turn your camera on for a moment so we can get a picture? Unless you're too shy. I'm pretty shy. I don't know that I can sit still for this. You... Oh, Fanny, come on, turn on, turn on your camera. I'm in bed. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. I, I was, I will frighten everyone. Trust me. <laughs> well, we got several. Uh... 
We got several. I'll get a picture of this much. Oh, I guess I should turn mine on, eh, if I'm trying to get everybody else to. I help. Yeah. Awesome. This is awesome. Chris, this is awesome. Good job. Thank you. I'm going to do one other screen share, and then I think we're probably done. If I can get screen share to work. Let's try this one. You look so distinguished there at the podium. That That's the face of me ranting and raving about things that I'm passionate about. There you go. All right. Well, I sure appreciate it. Sounds like everybody else does too. And we're now at 13.11. The clock struck 13 and beyond, and we started at about 12.05, so we've done the hour. Good deal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everybody. John, thank you so much for everything you do to protect the rivers. Well, thank you, and... Yeah, we can't do it without everybody else. Grassroots following, by which we mean participants. You know, for example, Janet, who managed to jump off before I could say this, she pretty much completely organized the silent auction for the recent gala. And she's busy in the events committee, and she does most of the membership committee organizing. So volunteers, that's what it's about. Definitely. We're retiring um, next year, so I'm hoping to be able to volunteer more. There you go. All right, I've got another webinar coming up on October 10th. It's the assistant manager of the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. He's going to talk about water and wilderness and wildlife on the Swanee River and the three refuges on the river. That'll be a good one. All righty. See you there. Bye for now.